Hey there, my name is Christopher from ECTV, and today I'm interviewing Angelina Leonios. Thank you for joining us to talk about some of your poetry, Angelina. Thank you for having me. Yeah, do you want to tell us a bit about yourself? Yes, yeah, so um, I am the 2021-2022 Ventura County Youth Poet Laureate. I'm also on a few board of directors, so for the Ventura County Arts Council and the California Poets in the Schools. I also won a competition called Poetry Out Loud, and I've been coaching for it ever since I graduated in 2019. So um, I just really have a passion for poetry, and I've been doing it since my junior year of high school. So it's really nice to be here. Ah. Can you explain what uh, Poetry Out Loud is? Yeah, so Poetry Out Loud is basically a high school competition where you recite other poets' poetry. Um, my first year, I did Maya Angelou's Caged Bird and The Albatross. And these were two poems that I thought really spoke on um, the human experience of confinement. And ironically, it really helped me because I hadn't really been comfortable on the stage for years. I had a lot of stage fright. I got anxiety when I was in front of people or a crowd or presenting in class. So this competition was really my way of breaking out of my shell and going out of my comfort zone. And I had a recitation coach named Fernando Salinas who really helped me to gain more confidence and work on these poems. And I ended up winning the school level both years, junior and senior year, and then advancing to state after county level my junior year. So it's really cool to return and be a coach now for that same competition. Um, and that's been such a great experience for me. Uh, and how, how long have you been doing poetry for? I've been doing poetry since that competition, actually. It was probably the first year that I really committed to writing my own poems. So I want to say about four years now, I've been mm. doing my own poetry and making some sort of career out of it, making a name for myself. So four years. Interesting. Um, do you have a favorite poet or poem? I have several favorites. It's really hard for me to choose just one. Um, there's a Chilean poet named Pablo Neruda, who is one of my favorites. He writes sonnets, and he has just been an influence. And ironically, it's because someone once told me, your poetry reminds me of him. And that's when I really started to read more of his work, and I wanted to embody that. So. And what writing style do you prefer for your poems? There's a lot of writing styles, from sonnets to haikus, soliloquies, whatever it is. I tend to try out some of them, but most of the time I like what's called stream of consciousness. And that's basically like journaling, just writing whatever you're thinking and feeling in the moment without editing it. And I find that a lot of my favorite and arguably best poems come from that, where I don't really focus on a certain form or length of the poem. It's just whatever happens in the moment. And that's what I really commit to. Was there anything that inspired you uh, to write poetry? Yeah, I had a lot of influences, not just poetry out loud, but I have always had a passion for writing. Um, I have this memory of my dad telling me that he wanted to be an author. And I was just a kid then, but I decided I want to be an author, I want to write, because that's what he wanted to do. And I looked up to him, and I realized that I really enjoyed writing for myself. I enjoyed telling stories and making up people and their experiences. And then I fell into a sort of depression in high school, and I stopped feeling confident in the things I was writing. I didn't feel motivated to write. So it wasn't until Poetry Out Loud that I decided, yes, I still liked writing stories, but I wanted to try something different. And as soon as I started doing poetry, it was just like a whole new world. And 
it's just been really therapeutic for me ever since. So I've been inspired by my dad, by Fernando, by my mom, by the people around me and the people whose voices aren't heard either. So there's a lot of inspiration and a lot that just keeps me going. And out of the poems you've written, do you have a favorite of them? I have a hard time choosing favorites, especially with my poems, because I like to see them as my children, <laughs> as weird as that sounds. I just feel like each one has a different part of me and ex has a, sim a similar experience as me, just a unique way of telling it. So I think one of my favorites as of now is a poem called Successful Conditions, and it's one that I'll be reading today, but that one, I was just so proud when I finished writing it, and it took me a few days and a lot of writer's block, which is actually uncommon for me because most of the poems I finish in the first and same day that I write it. So this poem just kind of felt complete when I finally did it, and I only shared it to one person, so it's really nice that I'll have this to share it with more people. Uh, of course. And uh, do you think you could read one of your own, own poems? This one, Rose on the Sidewalk, for us? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Rose on the Sidewalk. Look at Rose on the sidewalk up ahead. Watch as she strolls like it's nobody's business. After all, Nadia sabe. Nobody knows her business of being plucked off the street and touched by street boys with no respect for la reina she is. Mirala, Rosa caminando en la acera. Watch her walk on, off, gone, lost, forgiving too much of their stuff because she thinks she's the cause of it. Listen, Rose, escúchame. When I tell you, being played is so much less than you deserve. Tú eres más que un juego para los viejos. Pay no mind to the ones who have hurt you, because anyone who calls you anything below the name you claimed for yourself like the queen you are, si te llaman algo menos de tu nombre sagrada, they are not worth your body or time, ni tu cuerpo, ni tu tiempo. Cat calls like linda, niña bonita, querida flor, mi amor. Those words are so much less than the beauty that you possess. So Rose, please do your best to ignore the ones who endorse tainting angels like you. Because you're not the one who's lost like you always thought. They're the ones who forgot how to respect divinity. Porque han olvidaron el amor de Dios. You're the embodiment of the Garden of Eden in, the, in these godless urban streets. So Rose, the next time someone calls you a goddess, raise your pretty head high like you mean it. Forget to give them the time of day and give yourself enough time to believe it. That was one beautiful poem. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, could you explain the meaning behind it for us? Yeah, so um, Rose, of course, is the unofficial name of this woman I'm writing about and her experience just living her life and being objectified by men or people in general. And I think that's an experience that a lot of women, unfortunately, tend to experience. They have this fear of being seen as something less than human, something less than who they are and just an equal. So I had this poem be my way of raising awareness to that experience and how it has to change. And we have to teach women that they are so much more than they have come to believe because of it. Do um, you think you could read Cherry for us? I, was, I, re I really enjoyed reading it earlier myself. Cool, yeah. So this is Cherry. My nickname might as well be Cherry. I blush and show people my sweet sides so they never see the pit in my stomach. Every night, I let it toss and turn and pray it won't tear me apart. And sometimes it grows heavy like a child, haunted by the fear of being unwanted. So it clings to my body until it hurts. Sometimes it comes out in chunks. 
I call them words without meaning, but my closest friends call my bluff. Sometimes I reach down my throat and tear off a piece to show my parents. I hold it out like a trophy and tell them, this is what anxiety looks like. A buildup of every toxic thought I've planted within myself in the dark. Everyone tells me it's worse to hold it in, that suffering in silence is unhealthy, but how can I share my pain when it's deadly? It's ironic how poisonous I can be to myself when I try so hard to save everyone else. At least when I drown in my own mind, I'll find comfort in saving your life. Oh, that, was, that was really nice. Uh, could you explain what cherry means in it? Yeah, so this poem actually came from a very brief joke I made one day. And I thought to myself, I am just like a cherry because a cherry has a pit in its stomach. And supposedly, if you eat enough of those pits, you could have poison, <laughs> basically. Um, and I decided to write a poem about it because it was an exercise, actually, that I was showing to other people who were learning how to write poetry from me. And I told them, you can find a metaphor and a symbol anywhere. And I realized that was the symbol for me of my anxiety and how I try to present myself as someone who's confident and very, um, very confident in themselves, very confident speaking to others, but there is still the residue of that anxiety and stage fright that I carry and sometimes still express no matter how many times I do public speaking, I still get nervous and so that's what it meant to me. I think we all relate to that. Yeah. yeah. Um, for another poem, could you read Successful Conditions? Successful Conditions. It's no secret that art is my best friend and partner in crime. She's taught me every poetic device and rhyme that could run from this river I call my tongue. But one thing she never taught me was how to hold my place and keep a straight face when someone questions if I belong on stage. Now, I've never been called an imposter, but I've heard people ask whether I belong at all, and not even with words, but with their eyes. It's only until I have someone official come to my side and open the floor for me that I'm seen as someone worthy. But as a Hispanic with light skin, it's not like I have any insecurity. It's not like I hope and pray every day that my success has nothing to do with my skin because I've lived my whole life knowing this. I am privileged with the lightness of my body, and this is the reason no body has ever bothered me for being too dark, too Mexican, too other, that this is the reason my mother and I are rarely believed to be happily, that this is the reason I live happily, or at least happier than my partner, because she has been judged at every corner while I am told that I can do better than people like her. But haven't you heard? There's no difference between us. I swear I just have more luck than half the people I know because you wouldn't know that I'm Mexican without first asking if I'm Asian or white or anything else other than this beautifully brown ethnicity that feeds the city I grew up in. The one that's known for strawberries tended to by the hands of my family and neighbors who are all Mexican. A name that's been dragged through the dirt just like mine. No, no, it's not. Lianos, es leanos. And your racism shows when you give me that look because the way you react when I correct you speaks volumes on your values. Like whether or not I'm still pretty when you find out you have to use an accent just to address me properly. Like whether or not the way I dress is appropriate for a girl who is only white on the outside. Like whether or not I got the standing ovation at a creative economy presentation because I was the only brown girl in the room who didn't look like a brown girl in the room. Because the light reflected off my face just enough so that when I raised my voice, I wasn't seen as being forceful. I was seen as being powerful. You see, the difference between me and a handful of my family is that I can get away with most of the things they'd be criminalized for and I've been oblivious to it since I was a kid. Like how my uncles will sooner check their speedometer than see a doctor because being pulled over might just cost their lives. At least you can live with an infection. 
but discrimination will always be the deadlier condition to live with. So excuse me for introducing a topic like this. It's just the only way I can make up for being born with the upper hand, if only to hold my people up beside me and make their voices heard through my poetry. Wow, that was really well written. Thank you. Yeah. And you wrote, you wrote about your ethnicity in this poem. What made you want to uh, write a poem that was so personal? Like, were you wishing to create conversation or perhaps like, create a connection with others who also share your experiences? Yeah, so this poem um, was essentially trying to do both. I wanted to show that I acknowledge my privilege. Um, I've always known that especially as a second generation Mexican American and being lighter than most of my friends and family, that it's hard to fit in to either group. There are a lot of Mexicans and even family members in Mexico who have told me or judged me as not being Mexican enough. And then there are people here who think that, you know, I am not belonging in the American side. So I wanted this to really raise awareness to the tough truth that there are people like me who just want to show that we can be both. And we can acknowledge the fact that, you know, we have this privilege of you know, not being judged, not being glared at, not being followed, all these things that I have heard stories about. And I also wanted to connect to the ones who feel this and kind of feel this imposter syndrome with their own ethnicity. So I recently started feeling that, where am I really gaining this recognition because of my writing or because I fit this image of the perfect poet, if that makes sense. So this was my kind of catharsis of that and showing that I want to be unafraid to raise my voice and raise awareness to the discrimination that is still happening and that I hear my friends and family going through and I am aware of my privilege. So. I like how you want to speak up for a lot of people right there. Yes. And uh, for another poem, uh, could you read The Blue Room for us? Yes. So, The Blue Room. Welcome to my room. It's blue all year round, except for the occasional hues of red. The ones I get from falling too soon for people who say I love you, but never really do. The walls may shake and crack, but that's just from my anxiety attacks. They'll pass when I stop thinking, stop thinking. And my bed's a mess most days, but that's okay. I heard it helps with inspiration. At least an article told me that. I think it's true when they say artists tend to be depressed. Why else do you think we dress in this melancholy gray? We've simply faded from holding on to too much hope. The kind that comes and goes, but never really stays. I always love what I can't have and regret what I can never take back. But at least I have a TV here. It distracts me from the feelings that I lack. So welcome to my room. I hope you have a nice stay. Please stay. And when the time comes for you to leave, I'll lay myself across the floor. Won't you please walk over me like everyone else did before and don't forget to close the door. It's the only way you can stay safe from me. It's the only way I'll ever stop bothering you. That one was really nice. Um, figuratively speaking, like, what is the Blue Room from your point of view? So the Blue Room actually ended up being the first of a three-part poetry collection that I didn't expect at all. And the Blue Room was written as a metaphor of my mental state and emotional state, I wanted this concept of a room because it's both comforting and where we find solace in our time to just 
be who we are and you know whether it's going to our bed and whatever but also it can be very confining especially recently during the pandemic so there's this duality to it and blue room specifically was blue because it was my symbol of depression and that was a very unique experience for me and it varies for everyone but it's something that i wanted to be universally relatable and how there's different interpretations to it but in a sense we all have this room and we decorate it how we want we paint it and it just makes up who we are so this was my blue room and was this written during like a phase of sadness, depression, maybe anxiety attacks? Yeah, so this was actually written in the height of the pandemic around July, I believe. And this was really a time when I had so much time to myself that I thought I needed an outlet. I needed some way to express what I was feeling and that's how the blue room came to be and i just kept writing on it and writing sequels to it so it was definitely a time where i didn't feel depressed necessarily as i had before in high school but i was feeling similar feelings and having similar thoughts so this was my catharsis and my way to culminate that experience into something tangible in a way and have that be relatable for others yeah and on to the next poem yeah could you read art mi amor yeah art mi amor who said art isn't important to society who said it's not as fascinating as football, not as life-changing as life-saving services, not as powerful as politics? I spent several years studying art like a young teenager in love, and she's never failed to amaze me. Don't you know she saves lives every day? And not just mine. She's a mother making sure all of us have an outlet for our pain. Wouldn't you agree that she's beautiful when she's the reason we're all here today? A woman no one really values or understands, but still she rises to the stand and raises her voice and speaks her mind, her truth to the world. This poem speaks for me just as I do for her. My pen is my weapon in a world of chaos and art gives me the strength through it all. In fact, let me show you what I got. I could slam the ground with my words when they fall from my mouth and let the earth quake, shake, hold its breath just to take them in because I am a poet and I am proud to show it. Art is my best friend and partner in crime. She's taught me every poetic device and rhyme that could run from this river I call my tongue. So please don't you ever disrespect me or my poetry or my lover, especially when she's with me, because you'll never hear the end of this tale I call my passion, weaved into every breath I take, every step I take is dedicated to her, and these letters are written just for her. Art, mi amor. You are worth so much more than any community gives you credit for. You've helped me find my voice when I struggle to find myself, so let me repay you in every poem. In every art form that I show them, you will be my muse until the end of time, the reason I love and the reason I live. And I'll make sure everyone knows how important you are in everything I write. That was a, that was a really good poem. Thank you. Uh, uh, what is the meaning behind uh, the poem? So this poem was actually a request for a specific event, and they wanted me to write a poem about how art is important to society. And it was very interesting because they specifically requested it be in slam style, which is essentially a competitive style where it resembles rap and there's a lot of rhythm, there's a lot of fast pace, slow pace, and I am not very familiar with that style. I'm more of a performer than a slam poet. So what I decided to do was half, half the poem 
be performance style and the other half be slam style. So the line about slamming the ground with my words is where I pick up the pace and I try to recite it more as a slam poet. And it ended up being such a huge success and a huge favorite that I've had it requested for at least five events now over and over and it's been so nice to have one of my poems be so recognized and so admired and that's where the imposter syndrome came in where I was thinking you know just because of one poem I wrote am I worth it am I deserving of it so that's why it parallels with successful conditions which is actually technically the sequel to this and kind of showing you know in the success there is also this side of wondering whether that success is earned and art mi amor is just my ode to art and how it's gotten me here and helped me find my voice yeah. so i really like how you want to show the importance of art through there and real quick do you think you could explain who the woman is you wrote in art mi amor it's funny because art um, is almost a culmination of all the female figures in my life. There's one in particular who I very subtly referenced in both poems, but I wanted to show art as her own figure, as a woman who carries herself and has her own life, her own body, and almost showing this infatuation, but underneath that, this deep love for her, because she is referenced as a partner, as, you know, a romantic interest, because art is very romantic. It doesn't always have to be, you know, love poems or dedicated to someone, but in itself, art has undertones of passion, of love for interest, and that is why I wanted art to be a woman. And so she comes from the influence of my friends, my mother, my grandparents, you know, but in general, in the poem itself, she is kind of her own body and her own person. Well, thank you for uh, coming in and letting me interview you today, Angelina. Thank I had you. a great time speaking with you. And my name is Christopher. Thank you for watching ECTV, and we'll see you next time.